On Easter, Christians worldwide celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, which is interpreted about 44,000 often incompatible ways. For some, the resurrection was physical, meaning that Jesus was revivified, not a ghostly spirit like Casper, but a flesh and blood human being like you and me, assuming you're flesh and blood. <laughs> For the non-corporeal entities among us, the Gnostic schools taught that Jesus was never physical, but always a spirit only appearing to be physical. Some even claimed Jesus never left footprints when he walked. For them, the resurrection isn't literal, but a metaphor indicating the true spiritually, spiritually ascended nature of all humans. Well, for me, the debate about a physical or metaphorical resurrection is fun, but it's ultimately academic. I find all of the layers of meaning in the resurrection story spiritually compelling, and I'm always digging for new information to help me discern both what the original audience thought about resurrection, both generally and Jesus's, and how the concept might still be relevant today. This year, I've been contemplating a different perspective altogether, though. During Lent, as I was thinking about Jesus in the desert and how the Jewish people had spent so much time in the desert, both literally and figuratively, I began thinking of Jesus' story as a parable about Jews and Judaism. I've been focusing on Jesus in his Jewish tradition. Now, this isn't entirely unusual. I always urge Christians to build their faith on a firm understanding of Jesus as a first century CE Jew. But I've also started to consider that the gospel authors use Jesus as a literary personification of Judaism and the Jewish people during that tumultuous era. Let's remember that Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John are not only storytellers, but also, and probably primarily, writers, trying to convey layers of meaning, much of which they intentionally hide under coded prose, because the things that they're writing about can get a person crucified. Matthew's Jesus, in particular, from the desert temptation to crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension, embodies aspects of both the historical Jesus our personal spiritual journey, also ideas about God in the flesh and the Messiah, but also the historical struggle and glory of the entire Jewish people. It's not only Jesus in the desert during the 40 days of Lent, nor is it merely Jesus as a representative of our own desert experience, although both are valid interpretations of the temptation text. Jesus also represents the entire Jewish people, Israel, again finding themselves lost and wandering, trying to figure out who they are, what they've become, and whom God needs them to be in a world dominated by Gentiles, telling the Jews how to dress, what to eat, who their temple officials can be, and most offensively of all, how and whom to worship, including an earthly emperor. The Second Testament is, in part, a retelling of the First Testament Jewish experience through the incarnation of Jesus. The desert meandering of Joseph and Mary, the birth of a Moses-like Savior, his life, death, resurrection, and ascension all unabashedly recall First Testament stories about the people Israel and its millennia of teeter-tottering between independence and assimilation. The people. It's no wonder the authors compared Jesus to Moses and Adam and Isaiah and others. He is all of them and more, the entire Jewish experience to date intentionally wrapped up in one personality. Jesus on the cross epitomizes the fear of obliteration of Jewish culture, their religion, social practices, traditions, economics, politics, and Sabbath. Rome is trying to eliminate the entire way of Jewish being because it pays no fealty to any earthly king. It's a pattern of anti-Semitism the Jews remember from Egypt and Babylon. Unfortunately, it will manifest itself time and again for the next 2,000 years as one empire after another tries to eradicate the Jewish people for nothing more than trying to stay Jewish.
After his death, Jesus becomes part of an ongoing debate about what it means to be Jewish in a Roman or secular world. It's a particular concern among Jewish scholars of the era who are split mainly into two unfriendly camps. <clears throat> Excuse me. There are the Pharisees, mostly well-educated lay people who respect the written Torah but also champion oral and other traditions. They practice the uh, in the world but not of it spiritual philosophy. On the other side of the curtain are the very similar looking Hellenized yet still strangely fundamentalist Sadducees who believe that if an answer isn't literally spelled out in the Torah, then you're asking the wrong question. They were also hand-selected by the Romans to run the temple, and not particularly well-liked by the majority of Jews. Now, we need to flash back here for a quick moment just to understand how all of this came to be. Because in his ministry, Jesus is responding to a problem within Judaism that if not created by, then tremendously exacerbated by Alexander the Great. Later, the Gospel authors will use Jesus himself as a response to basically the question of just how much Greek is too much Greek. Alexander firmly cemented control of the ancient Near East about 340, 350 years before Jesus' birth, implicitly forcing indigenous people like the Jews to learn Greek culture and language in order to maintain trade, make alliances, and otherwise lead everyday lives. This commingling of cultures inevitably led to the cross-pollination of religious and spiritual ideas. It's perhaps impossible to overstate Alexander's Hellenic influence on Judaism and later Christianity. Opposition to Hellenism motivates Jesus and influences the way Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John write about Jesus a few hundred years later. Now, these days, I hope that most of us, well, I really hope that all of us, consider the cross-pollination of religious and spiritual ideas to be a good thing. When we share our cultures, we promote understanding and harmony. Unfortunately, for many people, cultural blending is an existential nightmare. And for most cultures 2,000 years ago, including the Jews, while cultural cooperation was encouraged, it had its limits. For example, marrying outside the faith could be cause for expulsion from the community. Consequently, by the time people start writing about Jesus in the first century of the Common Era, he represents more than himself and is certainly not viewed as a human sacrifice for sin. Instead, his death on the cross denotes the assimilation and death of Jewish culture. Now, this makes his resurrection all the sweeter because it's both personal and corporate, like the original ancient covenant which insists we act like God in the flesh and care for our neighbors. In the crucifixion, Judaism died. In the resurrection, it is born again. The resurrection signifies a rebirth of Judaism, less dependent on foreign cultures or authoritative scripture, more aware that God is working through the people to free them from the shackles of any authority other than God, including their temple priests and the Roman bureaucrats. In the resurrection, Jesus' followers see the covenant fulfilled and God's promises kept. Jesus, God's good and faithful servant, lives on after death. The empire doesn't win. God's love does. The Jewish people who later read about or listen to the stories about Jesus and the resurrection immediately connect the dots between an enlightened, God-connected master, themselves, their ancestors, their planet, and the significance of keeping their ancient covenant alive, even as they adapt to a continually changing world. Today, Jesus' followers are called Christians, and we face many of the same problems as our Jewish forebears. Some among us are so cozied up with the secular ruling culture that they would rather gag and jail dissidents like Jesus than listen to their truths. They would rather expel Jesus from the group than admit he's right about turning swords into plowshares. They would, like the Sadducees, instead lay down the literal letter of scriptural law, even though it's irrelevant, rather than, like the Pharisees, use reason and logic to fairly and authentically determine God's love for our contemporary era. Today, 
Many Christians would crucify Jesus, do crucify him every day when innocent people are senselessly murdered simply for being Jewish, black, Muslim, indigenous, or gay, or even for being the wrong type of Christian. Yet also today, there are billions of Christians who devote their lives to Jesus' social justice work, his healing ministry, his advocacy for the poor and disenfranchised, and all around unconditional love for his fellow human. And on this Easter Sunday, thousands of years after Jesus walked with his friends in ancient Judea, billions of us gather to remember the Jewish rebel, killed and resurrected because his faith was greater than his religion. Amen. Our question to consider today is, what does resurrecting faith look like to you? What would a resurrected faith look like to you, personal, corporate, and in any way? As usual, I'll send you into some small group uh, breakout rooms for a few moments.